If you haven't done so yet, pause the video, reread the problem before listening on. In part A, we have to find the magnitude of the electric field at a radial distance of 2 times R2. Now, if you notice, R2 is the radius of that cylindrical shell, so we need the electric field at a distance twice that radius, which means we're calculating the electric field on the outside of this entire structure. Now, to do that, we're going to have to create a fictitious surface. We call it a Gaussian surface, and we want to choose the geometry of our Gaussian surface to sort of coincide with the geometry of this structure. So in this case, we have cylindrical structures, so we're going to choose a cylindrical Gaussian surface. It would look something like the following. And so there is our cylindrical Gaussian surface, and you can see that it is enclosing both structures. So that's going to become important later on when we apply Gauss's law, is the fact that our Gaussian surface is enclosing both of those structures. Now, the electric field is going to be located on the surface of our Gaussian surface or our Gaussian cylinder, if you will. Right now, we don't know what direction the electric field is pointing. It may turn out that the electric field is pointing away from the structure at this location, or it may turn out that the electric field is pointing inward towards the structure. We're going to figure that out as well. That's going to be the answer to part B. But in order for us to calculate the magnitude of the electric field, let's take another view of our structure. So here is that view. We're sort of looking end on at the structure. The orange is the Gaussian surface. The darker blue is the cylindrical shell and the lighter blue is the cylindrical rod. And again, there's going to be an electric field either outward or possibly inward on the surface of our Gaussian cylinder. Now, in order to calculate that magnitude of the electric field, we have to apply Gauss's law. Gauss's law tells us that the following integral, which is going to represent the electric flux, so this is the total electric flux that's penetrating our Gaussian surface. We're going to calculate that momentarily. That's going to equal the total charge enclosed by our Gaussian surface divided by a physical constant. Now, let's begin to break down the left side. Let's begin to understand that integration. Now, no matter where we are on our Gaussian surface, our electric field is going to have a constant value. And that's because every point on our Gaussian surface is located at the same radial distance from this structure. And in addition, these charges are uniformly distributed on the shell or on the cylindrical rod. So all of this is to say is that no matter where we are on our Gaussian surface, the electric field is going to have a constant value. So let's keep that in mind. And as we keep that in mind, we want to actually take this dot product, which is what this total electric flux is, and maybe just rewrite it. You may have learned that a dot product can be rewritten as the magnitude of the electric field, the magnitude of this so-called dA vector, and then multiplied by the cosine of an angle. So we're just going to rewrite it in that fashion. And then as far as the electric field is concerned, we mentioned that that has a constant value everywhere on our Gaussian surface, so we can factor that out. And now it's time to talk about these little dA vectors. And basically what they are, they are little square patch elements along the surface of our Gaussian cylinder. They're very teeny tiny, so their areas are very small. And we can imagine just drawing a few of these little square patch elements, as they are sometimes called. And there is going to be a vector associated with those patch elements. It's called an area vector. And by convention, the area vector is chosen so that it points away from the interior of the Gaussian surface. So again, the little dA vector points away from the interior of the Gaussian surface, which means that we're going to point the dA vector in this fashion right here. So that's what a dA vector is. But now you might wonder, well, what's the sort of integral of dA? What does that even mean? Well, what we would want to do is take the sum of the areas of those little patch elements and add them all together, and that would give us the total sort of surface area of our Gaussian surface. Now, if we go back and look at the original picture, we can get another view of these little patch elements. So here's a dA patch element. Here's another one. We want to add all the areas of those. But if you think about that, that's just going to be the area of the side of this Gaussian cylinder. If we were to add all the areas of those little patch elements, we would get the total area of the sides of our Gaussian cylinder. So now you got to ask yourself, well, what's the area of a cylinder, in particular, the side of a cylinder? And you may have learned in a geometry class that the area of a cylinder, or rather the sides of the cylinder, is going to equal 2 
pi times the radius of the cylinder times the length of the cylinder. That is the expression for the area of the sides of the cylinder. As for the cosine of theta, that has to do with the angle between the dA vector and the electric field vector. Now we haven't figured out if the electric field is pointing away from the Gaussian surface or pointing inwards, kind of towards the Gaussian surface. So truthfully, we don't know the angle right now. We're going to disregard that for now. When we calculate the electric field, we're going to be able to figure out whether the electric field is pointing away or pointing inward. Just as a side note, if the electric field is pointing away from the Gaussian surface and the dA vector is also pointing away, then the angle between those two vectors would be zero degrees. On the other hand, if the electric field is pointing inward and the dA vector is pointing outward by convention, then the angle there would be 180 degrees. But again, we don't know that. So we're going to leave off the cosine of theta for now, calculate the electric field. And if the electric field turns out to be positive, then it's going to be pointing away from the surface. And if it's pointing, or if the electric field is negative, then it's going to be pointing towards the Gaussian surface. So we'll figure that out momentarily. But now it's time for the enclosed charge. Now, if you look carefully at this diagram, the charge enclosed by that orange circle is both Q1 and Q2. Our Gaussian surface is enclosing both of those. So we're gonna make sure that we add those charges to get the total enclosed charge. So there we have it, we've added those charges together. We're going to divide both sides by two pi RL in order to isolate the electric field. So there is our expression. Now the problem gives us these values. Let's just recap them. Remember R is the radius of this Gaussian cylinder that we have drawn. That was two times R2. So we wanna make sure we know that this is gonna be two times R2. But on the other hand, R2 was given as 10 R1. Isn't this fun? So we can actually replace R2 with 10 R1, but then R1 was given as 1.3 millimeters. So in fact, we have two times 10, and then R1 is 1.3 millimeters, but you have to multiply that by 10 to the minus three to get it into meters. Wow, so that's gonna be our value for R. The length was given as 11 meters. We know epsilon naught is a constant whose value is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. And then we know the charges as well. So Q1 was given, it had a charge value of 3.4 times 10 to the minus 12. And then Q2 was negative two Q1, which means it's gonna be negative two times that 3.4 times 10 to the minus 12. So we're gonna take all of those values and we're going to plug them into the electric field expression that we have developed. So everything has been plugged in. Let's just scoot down the paper for some room here. The electric field turns out to be about negative 0.214. Negative 0.214. The standard unit is Newtons per Coulomb. Now part A just wanted the magnitude. So we would take the absolute value of that electric field. and We get 0.214 Newtons per Coulomb. That is the correct answer to part A of the question. Part B asks for the direction. Now, since the electric field turned out to have a negative value, that means that it is pointing radially inward. So if we go back to our drawing, then the Gaussian field, excuse me, then the Gaussian surface should have all of the electric field vectors pointing inward. We were sort of speculating earlier as to what it would be, but now we know for certain that the electric field points radially inward at that location because of that negative sign. So now we are prepped for parts C and D, which asks us what are the electric field and the direction at a distance of five R1? So we're gonna to have to draw a new Gaussian surface. So there is the new setup here. Now notice something very carefully. This time the radius of our Gaussian cylinder is five R1. Now the radius of that outer structure, that cylindrical shell was 10 R1. So our Gaussian surface is actually located within that larger cylindrical shell, which means if you consider this carefully that that Gaussian surface, that orange Gaussian cylinder is only enclosing that cylindrical rod. It's only enclosing the lighter blue structure. The darker blue structure, which is that cylindrical shell is outside 
outside of our Gaussian surface, which means any charge on that outer structure is not going to be enclosed within that orange Gaussian cylinder. So the outer structure doesn't matter because we only care about the charge that's enclosed inside the Gaussian cylinder. So we're going to actually eliminate, in this case, that outer structure, again, because the Gaussian cylinder does not enclose the charge on that outer structure. So now we develop Gauss's law in a very similar fashion. Let's write down the equation. And by the same arguments presented earlier, we can simplify the left side by just rewriting it as the electric field times the sort of lateral area of the cylinder. And then for the enclosed charge, in this case, it's only going to be the charge on that lighter blue cylindrical rod that was signified by Q1. Let's divide both sides by 2 pi RL to isolate the electric field. Now, we've already listed the value for Q1. We just want to make sure we understand what the radius of this Gaussian cylinder is. You, you can see that we've marked the radius of the Gaussian cylinder as 5 R1, and we know the value of R1 from earlier. So let's go ahead and plug everything in. And when we simplify this, the electric field turns out to have a value of positive 0.855 newtons per coulomb. Now it's already positive, so the magnitude is the 0.855 newtons per coulomb, so that's the correct answer to part C. As for part D, which asks us for the direction, well, this electric field is positive, so that means that the electric field vectors are pointing radially outward at this particular location, so that is the correct answer to part D. In part E, we are asked for the charge on the interior surface of the shell. Now to accomplish that task, what we'll do is, and we'll redraw this momentarily, but we're going to consider a Gaussian surface that's located right here. So we're kind of drawing it on the sort of inner wall, excuse me, not the inner wall, but between the inner and outer wall of the cylindrical shell. We're going to draw a Gaussian surface right there, and that's going to help us evaluate the amount of charge on the inner surface of the shell. So let's go ahead and draw that. So here is my attempt at drawing this. I apologize if it's a little bit hard to understand and see, but what we have is the darker blue structure. That's the cylindrical shell. Now there's going to be charge located on the outer surface of the shell as well as on the inner surface of the shell. And we've labeled those charges as Q out and Q in. We've drawn the orange Gaussian cylinder as the orange circle there. Remember, we're looking at the cylinder end on. So the orange line is our Gaussian surface. Now we've made a very important statement here. We have said that the electric field is zero at all points on the Gaussian surface. So when I say all points on the Gaussian surface, I'm talking about these points right here. Now you may ask, why is that? Why is the electric field zero at all points on this Gaussian surface? Well, to answer that question, consider the opposite. Imagine that the electric field at those points wasn't zero. So if you had electric field vectors inside of this conducting cylindrical shell, so in other words, if you had electric field vectors at these little points right here, well, those electric fields would start pushing the charges in the conductor along, and you'd basically start getting a current. So for example, if you had an electric field vector pointing here, let's say, well, that electric field vector would push any charge that's located at that point, and it would create a current. Now, there is no current. There is no perpetual flowing current inside a cylindrical conductor. And so because there's no current there, there can't be an electric field there. So that sort of justifies why the electric field at those points must be zero. Now, that's important to keep in mind because when we look at Gauss's law, we have that integral. But if the electric field is zero at all points on that Gaussian surface, well, then the integral is going to have to equal zero. So in other words, if the electric field right here is zero, then this entire integral becomes zero. So we can greatly simplify Gauss's law. Now for the enclosed charge. The enclosed charge is the charge enclosed by that orange Gaussian cylinder. So ask yourself, well, what is that charge enclosed by that orange Gaussian cylinder? And you should be able to see that it would be the Q in plus the charge that we've labeled Q1, that lighter blue color. That is the total amount of charge enclosed by that orange Gaussian surface. So now what we'll do is multiply both sides of this by the epsilon naught to simplify this equation. And then to solve for Q in, we would just subtract Q1 from both sides. And now we've got it. Q in is simply negative of Q1. And since Q1 was 3.4 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs, this becomes the answer to this part of the question. That's the charge on the inner surface of the cylindrical shell. 
Now for part F, we have to figure out Q out. That is the charge on the outer surface of the cylindrical shell, but there's a nice algebraic concept at play here. Consider the fact that the cylindrical shell has two charges. It's got the charge on the outside and the charge on the inside. So we could say that the total charge on that cylindrical shell, which we know as Q2, that's the total charge on the cylindrical shell, that is just the algebraic sum of the inner charge and the outer charge. So subtract both sides of that equation by Q in, and you get the expression for the charge on the outer surface of the cylindrical shell. Now Q2 was negative Q1, so we'll fill that in, and now we've got it. We just have to fill in the values for Q1 listed earlier, as well as Q in, which we calculated in part E. And when you simplify that, you get negative 3.4 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs. That is the amount of charge on the outer surface of that cylindrical shell.